I should like to call your attention this morning to the words which are to be found in the first epistle to the Corinthians, the 15th chapter, verses 8, 9, and 10. Verses 8, 9, and 10 in the 15th chapter of the first epistle of Paul to the Corinthians. And last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. And last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. We are considering together this all-important theme to all of us who are Christians and in the Christian life, the theme that we have described under the heading of spiritual depression. God's people are constantly subject and prone to this. And there is nothing that therefore should engage our attention more closely or more urgently than this condition. Because there can be no doubt at all about it that what finally explains the fact that the vast majority of the people in this and in other lands are outside the Christian church is the failure of those who are inside the church to represent the truth truly. Men and women are ready to look at anything and to be interested in anything that is attractive. We are living in an age of advertising and people are ready and credulous to believe anything that is said to them. They believe advertisement. They believe what they're told. And so it follows of necessity that were they to see something or to find something in Christian people and in the Christian church, which evidently and obviously proclaimed that such people were living a life of joy and of happiness and of triumph, they would crowd after them and be anxious to discover the secret of their successful living. Therefore, I say, it is not an unfair deduction to say that what accounts for the fact that the masses are outside is the condition of those who are inside. So often we give the impression that we are dejected and depressed. Indeed, many would almost give the impression that to become a Christian means that you're face to face with lots of problems which never worried you before. And looking very generally and superficially, the man of the world comes to the conclusion that if you really want to be happy, you go to the people who are outside the church rather than to those who are inside the church. He's quite wrong, of course. But I say we must recognize his mode and manner of thinking. And we at any rate have to plead guilty to this charge that far too often, because we suffer from spiritual depression and are more or less miserable Christians, we grossly and grievously misrepresent the gospel of redeeming grace. And that is why we are engaged in this study of this condition. Not only for our own sakes. We do look at it for our own sakes because it's tragic that anybody who claims the name of Christ should be in this condition. But more important far is the other consideration of which I've just reminded you. Now, this of course is all due to the fact that we are confronted by a very powerful adversary. I've said what I've said not merely by way of criticism. I've stated it as a fact in order that we may consider it. The fact is, of course, that the moment we become Christian, we become subjected to the most subtle and powerful onslaughts of the one who is described in the Bible as the prince of the power of the air, that the one that now ruleth in the children of disobedience, the God of this world, Satan, the devil. And uh, as we go on considering this uh, condition and its various manifestations and causes, we cannot but be impressed by his subtlety. Uh, the way in which he is able to come to us and to attack us. And the subtle way in which he deludes us and leads us astray without our realizing it at all. And, of course, he is at his most subtle when he comes to us as an angel of light and as a would-be friend of the church and one who is interested in the gospel and in its propagation. 
Far according to the scriptures, he does that. It is this Apostle Paul who tells us in his second epistle to the Corinthians that he is able to transform himself into an angel of light. And it is at that point, I say, he is most subtle of all. Not only is he able, not only is he powerful, he is subtle. And as we look at these various uh, forms and methods of attack that he employs, this, I say, becomes more and more clear. The only thing, therefore, to do is to uh, prepare ourselves for the hymn and for the attacks. And the way to do that is to study the scriptures. Here we are told all about him. We are given an insight into his methods. We are not ignorant of his devices, says the Apostle Paul. Again to these Corinthians. But the tragedy is that so many are ignorant of his devices, don't even believe in his existence. And even those who do believe in him forget him and fail to realize that he's always there and always attacking. And in this particularly subtle form. Now, as we look at what he does to us objectively, we cannot, of course, but be amazed at ourselves and at our unutterable folly. You look at some of these cases of spiritual depression that are recorded in the Bible, and as you read of them and look on at them, you say, well, how could a man have fallen to that? It seems so perfectly plain and obvious, yet we are constantly falling to the same thing. That is because of the subtlety of his method. He conceals himself, and he puts it to us in such an interesting and attractive manner that we have fallen almost before we realize that anything happened. Well, now then, I say the way to deal with all this is to study the methods and to, dis and to study the various teachings of the Scripture itself with regard to this condition. And that is what we want to continue doing this morning. Now, we've looked at this from various aspects. And last Sunday morning, we were looking at it in this way, that so many are depressed because they will keep on looking back into their past life, and especially to some sin of which they once were guilty. Not uh, sins in general, not sin in general, but some one particular sin. That has often crippled many people. They seem to be quite clear about everything but this one thing. They can't forgive themselves, they can't get over it, they can't forget it, and they're constantly in trouble as the result. Now I want to continue that theme in a sense. I want again to consider with you the case of others who are crippled in the present by looking back to the past. Not this time to some particular sin, but rather to the fact that they spent so much time in that condition and were so late in coming into the kingdom. Now this is again an extremely common cause of spiritual depression. The people who are depressed by the fact that they've wasted so much time, wasted so many long years, and have been so slow to become Christian at all. They're always bemoaning the fact that they've missed so many opportunities, opportunities of doing good and of helping others, and opportunities of service. They say, if only I'd seen all this when I was young, I'd have volunteered for service, but I didn't. I've only seen it now. It's too late. Missed opportunities. Or they put it in terms of what they might have done in some other form, some various other activities. Or they may put it in this form. What they might have been by now, if only. That's the term, if only. But they didn't. They spent so many years out in the world and not understanding these things. And they've missed the opportunities of doing good and of helping others and of service. And they think of themselves, what they might have been, how they would have grown in grace, the point they would have arrived at by now. But they're mere beginners and mere children. They look back like this to the past and they regret it and they bemoan it. They look back at the joys they might have had. The years of happy, joyful experience they might have had. But it's too late. The opportunity is gone. Why were they so foolish? How could they have been so blind? Why were they so slow? They'd heard the gospel. They'd read books. They even felt something at a certain point. But nothing happened. The opportunity was allowed to go. And here they are now. At long last they've come into it. But 
And there's the phrase, if only. Now, this, I say, is a very common condition. And it accounts for this state of spiritual depression in large numbers of people. How do we deal with this? What have we got to say about it? Well, I want to look at that with you this morning. Let me start by saying that while it is perfectly right for such people to regret the fact that they've uh, been so slow in this respect, it's quite right to regret it. But it is quite wrong to be miserable about it. You can't very well look back across your past life without seeing things that you regret. That's perfectly all right. But this is where the subtlety comes in with this condition. We cross that fine distinction, that line, between a legitimate reg regret and a wrong condition of misery and of dejection. Now the Christian life is a very finely balanced life. That's one of its... Uh, most attractive features. It's often been compared to a man walking on a knife edge. You can fall here or there. It's a condition which involves a certain type of tension, a true tension, a good tension, a right tension. Not that the tension that involves strain, but it is such a high and noble and exalted life that all along we are having to draw these subtle distinctions. And here is one of them. A legitimate regret, a wrong condition of dejection and of misery. Well, very well then, how do we avoid this being miserable? Well, we are going to do that in terms of what the Apostle Paul says here about himself, which always seems to me to be such a perfect illustration of what our Lord taught in that parable that we read together out of the 20th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew. I hope at some later time to return to that parable in the 20th of Matthew again and look at it from a slightly different angle. We shall be looking at it this morning from the standpoint of the people who are only engaged at the 11th hour and who are the last to enter into the kingdom. But before we come to that specific treatment of the matter in terms of scripture, let me consider this with you in a more general way. Now, there are certain principles of common sense and of general wisdom that need to be applied to this condition. I wonder whether I need to make an apologia for saying that or for proposing to do that. There are some people who seem to think that it is wrong for a Christian ever to use common sense. They seem to think that he must always be uh, doing everything in some kind of purely spiritual manner. Now that seems to me to be very unscriptural. The Christian is never less than the unbeliever. He's always more. The Christian is a man who can do everything that the unbeliever does, but more than that. That's the way to look at the Christian. So the Christian is a man who is to apply common sense to positions and to situations. And it is right and legitimate that he should do so. If you can conquer the devil at that level, conquer him at that level. It doesn't matter what level you conquer the devil at as long as you conquer him. If you really can defeat him and rout him by using just common sense and ordinary wisdom, do so. It's a perfectly right and legitimate thing for a Christian person to do. Now, I'm saying all this because I often find that uh, people are in difficulty about this matter because they fail to do that. They've spent the whole of their time in praying about this thing instead of doing something that I say is perfectly obvious from the standpoint of common sense. Let me go on to explain what I mean. Now, the first thing, in other words, for anybody to say to himself who's in this condition, or if you have to help somebody who's in this condition, the first thing you have to say to them is this. That to be miserable thus in the present because of some failure in the past is a sheer waste of time and a waste of energy. That's all I mean. Now, I say that's common sense. The past cannot be recalled. You can do absolutely nothing about it. 
Here you are in the present. You've become a Christian. You say, oh, if only. But what a silly, what a foolish, what a ridiculous thing to say. You cannot recall the past. You can do nothing at all about it. You can sit down and be miserable and go round and round in circles for the rest of your life. It'll make no difference to what you haven't done. Now that's common sense, isn't it? It doesn't need a special Christian revelation to see that. The world in its wisdom tells us that it's no use crying over spilt milk. Well, apply that to the devil. Why should the Christian be more foolish than anybody else? Why should he fail to apply common sense and ordinary natural human wisdom? But that's precisely what these people are doing at this point. They are wasting their time and their energy in vain regrets about something that they cannot affect. They cannot change, they cannot undo it. Now I lay it down as a fundamental postulate of life at any level that that is a purely foolish and irrational thing to do. Very well then, let's lay this down as a principle. We must never for a second worry about anything that cannot be affected by us. It's a waste of energy. If you can't do anything about a thing, stop thinking about it. If it's done or hasn't been done once and for all and belongs to that past that is finished with once and forever, never again look back at it. Never think of it. If you do, it's the devil who's defeated you. Beyond any question. Vain, useless regrets must be dismissed as irrational and idiotic. But oh, how many are victims of that? They sit down and they go back over it and go over all the details again and express their sorrow and their regret and their misery, my friend. Stop doing it. Quite apart from Christianity. It's a foolish thing to do. It's a sheer waste of energy. A waste of time. But let's go on. Not only that. To do that simply causes failure in the present. While you are sitting down and bemoaning the past and regretting what you haven't done in the past, you are crippling yourself in the present and preventing yourself from working in the present. Is that Christianity? Of course it is. Christianity is common sense and much more, but it is common sense, let's remember. Ah, oh, but you say, I could have heard that out in the world. Well, if you could, hear it and act on it. Our Lord himself has said that the children of this world are wiser in their generation than the children of light. He commended the unjust steward. I'm simply doing that. The world there, the common wisdom of mankind is perfectly right. It is obviously a wrong and a foolish thing to be crippling yourself in the present by vain regrets about a past which you can't undo. It is always wrong to mortgage the present by the past. It is always wrong to allow the past to act as a break or as a drag upon the present. Let the dead past bury its dead. There is nothing, I say, that is more reprehensible, judged by any canon of thought, than to allow anything that belongs to the past to cause you to be a failure in the present. And it does, of course. The people I'm describing are failing in the present. Instead of doing something and getting on with the Christian life, they're sitting down and are bemoaning the past, and they spend hours and weeks and months and, if necessary, years of it. They're so sorry about this that they're doing nothing in the present. How wrong it is. How reprehensible. And my third argument from the standpoint of ordinary common sense and human wisdom is this. That if you really believe what you say about your past, if you're really quite genuine about it, if you really do bemoan the fact that you've lost and wasted so much time in the past, the thing to do is to make up for it in the present. Isn't that common sense again? Here's a person who comes to me in utter dejection. Oh, if only the time I've wasted. And what I say to such a person is, are you making up for lost time? Why are you using this, these minutes and this energy in telling me about that wasted past which you can't undo? Why don't you put your energy and your time into doing something now? I speak with vehemence because I believe this condition has got to be dealt with in this way. 
The last thing to do with such people is to sympathize with them. And if you are suffering from this condition, be ruthless with yourself. Shake yourself. Attack yourself. On all grounds of ordinary common sense, you're behaving as a fool. You're irrational. You're wasting your time and your energy. You're not really believing what you're saying. You're indulging in self-pity. If you bemoan the wasted past, make up for it in the present. Give yourself entirely to activity at this present moment. That's what Paul did, wasn't it? Last of all, he was seen of me also as a one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, that I'm not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God, but... By the grace of God, I am what I am. I've wasted a lot of time. The others have gone ahead of me, but this is the truth. I labored more abundantly than they all. I've made up for it. I've caught up with them. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Very well. There is the argument. There is the way uh, of dealing with this thing from the uh, standpoint and the aspect of common sense and of ordinary common or garden human wisdom. But now let's go beyond that. That's enough, you know. That should be sufficient. But let's go beyond it. The Christian, I say, is not less than the unbeliever. He's always more. He has all the common sense and wisdom of the unbeliever, yes, but he has something on top of that, much greater than that. And here we come to this statement of the great apostle and to our Lord's teaching in the parable of the vineyard in Matthew 20. Now, let us again see what the Apostle has got to say. As we saw last Sunday morning in what he said about the great sin in his life, and as we saw that that alone is enough, rarely, we will find the same thing again this morning. What does the Apostle say? Well, listen to it. He's been giving an account of these resurrection appearances. He's really concerned about that great doctrine. But this is how he puts it. Last of all, he was seen of me also. Now the apostle undoubtedly regretted that. Let's be clear about what he means when he says last of all. He means, first of all, the last of the apostles. He was the last of the apostles to see the risen Lord. They'd all seen him in different ways together. He wasn't with them then. He was a blasphemer, a persecutor at that point and at that time. So last of all, last of the apostles. But not only last of the apostles. He was literally the last person of all persons to see the risen Lord. No one has ever seen the risen Lord with his naked eyes since the apostle Paul saw him on the road to Damascus. Last of all. You see, he showed himself to 500 brethren at once. We don't know their names even. But he did show himself to these various witnesses that are recorded here. But the very last person of all to see him was Saul of Tarsus. Because what happened on the road to Damascus was not that Paul had a vision. Many have had visions since. That wasn't a vision. He literally saw the Lord of glory with his naked eyes. And that was what blinded him. And that's what he says here. Last of all, he was seen of me. That's what made him an apostle. He was a witness to the fact of the resurrection. But the thing he's emphasizing is this. That he was the very last of all. But you see, he's not content with leaving it at that he adds. Last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. Another translation here is this. Last of all, seen of me also, who am an ectopic. Ectopic. He's a sort of ectopic gestation. There's something unnatural, almost monstrous about his birth. Not, uh, he hasn't come into these things in the way that others came in. The others had been with the Lord during his life. They'd listened to his teaching. Uh, they'd been with him uh, right to the very end and had seen the crucifixion. Uh, they'd been together when he appeared unto them after the resurrection during the 40 days. They'd been together at Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. They were all there at the beginning. They'd been right through it all. And here is Paul. A kind of unnatural birth, untimely birth, an ectopic. 
He's come in, as it were, in some odd, strange way. There's something unnatural. That's how he's come in. And last of all, that's what he says about himself. And of course, he could never think of that without regret. He should have been in at the beginning. He was a Jew like the others. He'd had the facilities and the opportunities. But he hated it. He hated Christ. He verily thought with himself that he should do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. He regarded him as a blasphemer. He tried to exterminate his followers and his church. There he was outside. All the others were in and in from the beginning and knew it all. But at last and last of all and in this strange way he'd come in. How easy it would have been for him to have spent the rest of his life in vain regrets about the past. He does say here, you know, Last of all, he was seen of me, for I am the least of the apostles, that I'm not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. It's perfectly true. And he bitterly regretted that, but that didn't paralyze Paul. Paul didn't spend the rest of his life sitting in a corner and saying, of course, I have no right to speak. I've been so long coming in. I'm the very last to come in. And I did this and that. Oh, why didn't I see it? Why didn't I believe in him? How could I have rejected him? That's what these people with spiritual depression do. They passed from regret to dejection. The apostle didn't. What struck him was this, was this amazing grace that ever brought him in at all, though he was the last. And he said, there's no time to lose, I must be up and doing. And he pressed into it with his tremendous zeal and passed them all. Last of all, and yet he became first in a sense. Well, what's his teaching? Well, let's take the apostle's experience and look at it in the light of the parable in the 20th of Matthew. They both say the same thing. The teaching that I would deduce would be something like this. What matters, first of all, my dear friend, if you're a Christian, what matters, first of all, is not what you once were, but what you are. Doesn't it sound ridiculous? It's so perfectly obvious. It's almost childish. I say that what matters, not what you once were, but what you are. Yes, how obvious when I put it like this, but how difficult to see it sometimes when the devil attacks you and takes you back over your past. The apostle having said that he is not worthy to be called an apostle because he persecuted the church of God adds, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. What's it matter what I was? I am what I am. Put your emphasis there, I say. Don't be ever considering what you were. The essence of the Christian position is to be ever reminding yourself of what you are. Oh yes, there is your past with all its sin, but say this to it. Ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven. Who like thee his play should sing? I am what I am. Whatever the past may have been, it's what I am that matters. What am I? I'm forgiven. I'm reconciled to God by the blood of Christ. I'm born again. I'm a child of God. I'm adopted into God's family. I'm an heir with Christ and a joint heir with him. I'm going to glory. I am. That's the thing that matters. Not what I was, not what I've been. Do what the apostle did therefore. If the enemy is attacking you along this line, turn to him and say, what you're saying is perfectly true. I was that, but what I'm interested in is not what I was, but what I am. I am what I am, by the grace of God. The second deduction is this, and they're all simple and they're all obvious. It isn't the time of your entry into the kingdom that matters, but the fact that you're in the kingdom. That's the thing that matters. How foolish it is to mourn the fact that we were not in before, and there to allow that to rob us of the things that we might be enjoying now. It's like somebody going into a great exhibition. But there's a long queue and this person has come rather late, has, didn't get up in time, or something else. This person arrives at the exhibition and has to wait a long time. Lots of people get in. He's about the last to get in. What did you think of such a man who now having got in through the door and there he is in a position to look at the paintings or the sculpture or whatever it is, simply stands just inside the door saying, 
What a shame that I wasn't the first to get in. What a pity that I wasn't in quite right. You're laughing at it very rightly, but may I point out to you that you're laughing at yourself. That's precisely what you're doing spiritually. Oh, that I've left it so long. My friend, begin to enjoy the pictures. Look at the sculpture. Enjoy the treasures. What's it matter when you came in? The fact is you're in, and it's there open all of it before you. It isn't the time of your entry. Go back to your 20th of Matthew again. They were the last, the 11th hour, but they were in. That's the thing that counts. They'd been taken hold of, they'd been employed. He'd called them, they're in. It's being in that matters, not when you came in, nor how you came in. Oh, I could elaborate this at great length. One so constantly has to be saying this. It isn't even the mode or the manner of your conversion that matters. What matters is the fact that you're converted. But people will sit down and worry about the way they've come in. They haven't had somebody else's experience. Or it didn't happen in this precise way or manner. Time, mode, manner, method. It doesn't matter. What matters is, are you in? If you're in, well, rejoice in it and forget that you were ever out. The time element is quite unimportant. But I must go further. I suggest that this condition of spiritual depression, because of this particular thing, really is due to the fact that this person is still morbidly and sinfully preoccupied with self. I said just now we have to be brutal with this condition, and it's got to be said. The real trouble with this person is still self. What are they doing? Well, this is what they're doing. They're still judging themselves instead of leaving it to him. You see, there they are lashing themselves and scarifying themselves because they were so late and so long. And they're condemning themselves. They appear to be very humble. They appear to be full of contrition. They're not humble at all. It's mock modesty. It's self-concern. They're judging themselves instead of leaving it to him. Listen to Paul saying the self-same thing in the fourth chapter of this same epistle. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of men's judgment. Yea, and this is one of the greatest things Paul ever said. Yea, I judge not mine own self. For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified, but he that judgeth me is the Lord. As Christians, we must leave our judgment to him. He's the judge. And you have no right to waste his time nor your own time and energy in condemning yourself and lashing yourself. Forget yourself. Leave the judgment to him. Get on with the work. It suggests this morbid preoccupation with self in the matter of judgment. Not only that, you see, it's, it indicates a proneness still to think in terms of amassing merit and of what we can do. Here, this person comes to us in this apparent modesty and says, you know, if only I'd come in sooner, what a lot of work I could have done and so on and so forth. What this person is really indicating is that he or she might have done so much and the kingdom would have benefited so much. You see, it's amassing merit. The number of years counts and I could have built up this tremendous amount of credit and of merit. It's quite wrong, that's utterly false. The whole parable our Lord spoke in the 20th of Matthew was designed to demolish that argument. We must be rid of that. We must cease to think in terms of what we can do and what we can build up. The time element of necessity introduces that. But let me put this positively as I close. I've said uh, part of the trouble of these people is that they're still morbidly preoccupied with themselves. They haven't learned that as Christians they should finish with self, deny self, take up the cross and follow him. Leave yourself in his hands utterly and absolutely, past, present and future. Ah, yes, but what's it due to? Why are they thus morbidly preoccupied with themselves? The answer is, of course, that they're not sufficiently occupied with him. And that is the final explanation of this condition. It is our failure to know him and his ways 
as we should know them. My dear friends, if we only spent more of our time in looking at him, we'd soon forget ourselves. I said just now, if you're in that exhibition, don't stand at the door, bemoaning the fact, look at the pictures, look at the treasures, or let me take that into its spiritual content. You've come into the Christian life very well, then stop looking at yourself and begin to enjoy him. What's the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian? Well, Paul in the second epistle to the Corinthians says it's this. That the non-Christian is a man who looks at Christ and at God with a veil over his eyes and over his heart and he can't see. What's a Christian? This is his description. But we all, every one of us as Christians, we all, with open face, the veil is gone, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory. That's the Christian. He spends his time in looking at him, in gazing upon him, in meditating. He's so enraptured by the sight of him, he's forgotten himself, his past, is everything else. That's the trouble. If you were only more interested in Christ, you'd be less interested in yourself, my friend. Begin to look at him. Gaze upon him with this open face. And then go on to learn that in his kingdom what matters is not the length of your service, but your attitude towards him and your desire to please him. He doesn't count service as other people do. Go back again to the parable. He is interested in the heart. We are interested in time. We're all clocking in and counting the time we've spent and the work we've done, like those first men who went in. All this time we've spent, we all tend to do that. And then if we haven't gone in at the very beginning, we say, ah, oh, we haven't done this, we've missed all this time. Our Lord isn't interested in your work and mine in that way. He's interested in the heart. It's the widow's might that interests him, you know. It wasn't the amount of money. It was the sacrifice. It was the woman's desire. It was the woman's heart. And it's the same everywhere. It's the same there in the 20th of Matthew. He gives a penny to the people who've only been in an hour. Why? Well, he's interested in the devotion. And that was the case of Paul as he defines it here. Last of all, Last of all, he revealed himself unto me also. I'm a sort of ectopic. But thank God, that doesn't make any difference. His grace covers it all. By the grace of God, I am what I am. He's not interested in time. He's interested in relationship. And that brings me to the last point. The thing you see that matters in the kingdom is nothing but the grace of God. That's the whole point of the parable, isn't it? He's got a different way of doing things. He doesn't see as men do. He doesn't compute as they do. Is thy naive ill because I am good? It's all grace from beginning to end. You see, the last people who went in were given the penny exactly as the first. They were given the same wage, the same amount, the last as the first. And indeed, he impresses it and drives his point home by saying this that many that are lost shall be first, and the first last. We've got to cease thinking in this carnal, human, fleshly, temporal manner. In the kingdom of God and of Christ, the standpoint is that of grace, and it cuts across all our rules and regulations. It's his grace that matters. By the grace of God I am what I am. So stop looking back at what you haven't done and the years you've missed or anything like that and realize that in his kingdom and under his grace you who have come in last may find yourself to your own amazement and astonishment one day as first. And like the people in the parable at the end of Matthew 25 you'll say, when did I do this? When did I do that? He knows, he sees his grace is sufficient. Very well then. I close with an exhortation from the Old Testament. In the morning therefore sow thy seed and in the evening withhold not thine hand for thou knowest not whether shall prosper either this or that or whether they both shall be alike good. 
I wonder whether I'm speaking to somebody who spent a lifetime outside Christ and in sin and in the world. Somebody who's come in at an old age and is tempted of Satan in the way I've been describing. My friend, my word to you is this. In the evening, the evening of your life, withhold not your hand. In this marvelous kingdom of grace, which is miraculous and supernatural, you may find on the day of judgment that you've got a much bigger crop than those people who were saved in their youth. What a glorious gospel. Youth is the great word today. Here's a gospel for the aged. For the octogenarians, the nonagenarians, don't matter, doesn't matter. Age is irrelevant. And it's unscriptural to emphasize it as we do. In the morning sow thy seed. Yes, but with equal force, I would say, in the evening, withhold not thine hand. And then, perhaps one of the most comforting and wonderful things that is found anywhere in Scripture, it was spoken through the prophet Joel, as he was given that great vision and understanding of the kingdom of grace and of Christ that was to come. This was the word he was given to Atta. I will restore the years that the locust hath eaten. He's promised to do it. He can do it. The wasted years, the barren years, the years when the locust and the canker worm and the caterpillar and all these others had devoured and destroyed everything. There was nothing left. It was utter barren, waste and wilderness. There's nothing there. He says, I will restore the years that the locust hath eaten. You see, if you think of it in terms of what you can do with your strength and power, well, time is of the essence of the contract, isn't it? But we're in a realm where that doesn't matter. He comes in. And he can give us a crop in one year that will make up for ten. I will restore the years that the locust hath eaten. That's your master. That's your saviour. That's your God. So I say in the light of this, never look back again. Never waste your time in the present. Never waste your energy. Forget the past. Leave it. And rejoice in the fact that you are what you are by the grace of God. And that in the divine alchemy of his marvelous grace, you may yet have the greatest surprise of your life and of your existence. And find that even in your case it will come to pass that the last shall be first. Praise God for the fact that you are what you are and that you're in the kingdom. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.